The project originated with our superintendent, Dr. Camille Castile. She wanted a program that would offer future administrators and community members and staff and, and faculty members the opportunity to understand how our district evolved. This documentary traces the history of Chandler Unified School District from its roots in, you know, just a cook shack uh, where they taught the children of construction workers building the first buildings in Chandler um, up through current day. There have been four videos produced for the History of Chandler Schools project. The first was called CUSD Namesakes, and it offered information about the families and individuals that the district schools are named for. Namesakes gave us the opportunity to experiment with some hand-drawn elements and, and manipulating some photographs to help tell the stories. So when we finished that project, we had learned quite a bit about you know, illustrating the story we wanted to tell. Then we produced the three-part History of Chandler Schools documentary. Part one was called The First Bell Rings. It covers the period between 1910 when the district was more or less created, and 1914, when Chandler High School was first established. The reason for the refusal is where the story first gets complicated. Part two is called Monumental Progress. It picks up in 1914 and carries the story through 1922, when the Chandler High School building was uh, open and dedicated. The departure of Merton Rice left the trustees in a difficult position. The school year was only a few weeks away and they had no school administrators. Part three is called Summary of a Century and it carries the, the story from 1922 up to present day. Okay, and it does that in 35 minutes, so it's really a, a really is a summary of uh, the district's history. W.G. Austin decided to retire after 30 years as superintendent of Chandler Schools. In his place, the board promoted assistant superintendent Kenneth Knox. Knox, in turn, selected the junior high principal, Ted Perry, to fill his vacated position. I think it's important to keep in mind that we've been collecting photographs and documents for this project since 2005, and we've digitally archived them. My name is Ernest Robinson, and I was a lead researcher on this project. I started out the research process with uh, gathering information on uh, the folks that some of our schools were named after trying to get in touch with how the city was formed with Dr. Chandler, history on the city, um, its growth, um, where the people came from, major accomplishments and challenges for the city. I would consider the script writing process to be the biggest challenge that I face. I started by basically gathering my source materials into a big pile, I organized them, put them in you know, chronological order, and then just started taking notes. There was a lot of things that Mike had to be labored to cut out of the script to, to make it more of a, a shorter and cohesive script, but still be able to tell a lot of the key elements of our, our district's growth. My name is Tim Wong, and I am the art director and animation supervisor on the History of Chandler Schools documentary. Part one, we were kind of figuring out our process. And though it wasn't perfect, it gave us a really good basis to figure out the streamlined kind of process of, you know, one person doing the storyboard, one person doing the artwork, and handing off the shots along the line so that we could work quickly and efficiently. A big dilemma was coming up with the visuals to fill the holes in the archival research that we had that you know obviously we're not gonna have a lot of photos we're definitely not having video footage from the early 1900s so we had to come up with uh, visuals that were comparable to what was happening in the time period so a lot of the characters the historical figures that we're working with we had to draw ourselves 
So each part of the documentary has a slightly distinct visual style, and this is because, you know, not only are we progressing through history, so historically there is a different aesthetic in the 1920s than there was in the 1960s. So we tried to match that in uh, the visuals of the documentary itself, but also we realized that we had more footage, obviously, and more photos for later on in history uh, that we didn't need as much uh, as much artwork to fill the gaps. So the style kind of shifted from part one, you'll see a lot of hand-drawn artwork with animation, uh, a bit more cartoony of a style, but not necessarily cartoony. We, we make the animation a bit more realistic towards part three, where you'll see we're blending uh, hand-drawn characters with photo real backgrounds, or we'll take uh, photo elements and turn them into Photoshop and After Effects puppets and we'll animate real photos. So when we're developing a shot, really it starts with the script. We'll read the narration and pretty much line by line break those up into pictures in our storyboard. We'll figure out what makes sense to be literally drawn and then for some of the more kind of metaphorical or conceptual things we'll kind of interpret those. Then from the storyboard we'll meet, we'll hopefully do as much editing as possible in that storyboard phase and then go on to drawing the artwork for each of those shots. That'll get scanned in, colored, shaded, and textured and then eventually hand it off to the animation person who will set that up in the scene, um, animate it, and then ultimately render it. It will be less of a burden on the taxpayers than starting a new structure. We amassed quite a library of, of footage and, and pieces of art and backgrounds. We would make sure to draw out different parts so we can rotate things individually to make someone wave. We would have a separate hand uh, artwork and a separate arm artwork and then we could rotate each of them separately in uh, After Effects so that the, the character has some sort of motion, some sort of life. When I'm composing a scene, I'll base um, the composition off the storyboard. I won't go off of it uh, exactly. I'll kind of um, add uh, things that are necessary like camera movements, uh, sometimes different placement of the elements, uh, just to make a good overall composition. We also utilized what's called the puppet tool in After Effects, and with that we can essentially place pins inside the artwork or the photo and manipulate them through distortion so that uh, the, a single image looks like it's moving and it's alive. So uh, that was a lot of fun to create all of those different techniques and to be able to essentially make really nice, realistic looking animation uh, without having to draw things over and over and over again like you would do in uh, traditional animation. We had a meeting and we talked about the style of the narrator that we wanted to do our video. We decided to hold auditions and we just, you know, invited everybody in the district to come and participate. And from the 2000 school district employees, we got about 22 people that came in and actually auditioned for us. And that's how we found John Prothrow. And while the other districts have grown fast, it is conceded that Chandler has led the school procession of progress. Right now it is... While our artists were at work, another group of us conducted a number of record sessions to get our narration recorded. I think I do a pretty good job, but then they'll tell me, no, John, do it again. Um, okay, do it again, John. Um, let's do this one a little slower this time but I know that's part of the process, and I've loved every moment of it. Chandler began another wave of new school construction to keep pace with district growth. He was such a dream to work with, but we said he needs to be on camera. For part one, we recorded John's on-camera bits uh, against a green screen, and then we superimposed him into a computer-generated Im imitation of the Chandler High School main corridor. and. Uh, that turned out really well. I, I kind of like the, the unique look that it had. But I decided that in parts two and three, we should just go on location and record in the actual Chandler High Corridor. Well, you can't look down. Oh, oh, look down. down. That was a little trying when we were at Chandler because the air conditioning wasn't on. I remember it being really warm and uh, 
trying to keep cool. There were fans the guys brought in, and we had to keep working with the lighting. I know Ernest had to work really hard to get the lighting right. Chandler Schools was history. It had been a period of opportunity. All through production of part one, we kind of kept joking among the staff that, uh, yeah, we're going to win an Emmy. We're going to win an Emmy with this and, and so forth. And that, that went on for months. So I thought, we still have time and it, it qualifies. So I joined the Academy, the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences, and entered the, uh, entered the video into the competition under the category of historical documentary. Getting nominated for the Emmy was extremely exciting um, and also really motivating. We found out about it towards the end of part three, and you know, I, I think it really gave us a little, the little push that we needed to power through and, and you know, get the, the project as a whole done. Well, we didn't win, it was, you know, it was still just an awesome experience, and that was just part one. We got two more parts to go.